Um, I think a couple of our speakers are muted. There we go. Can everybody hear me, speakers? Hello? Yep. Um, hello to everybody attending and thank you so much for your patience. Sorry for starting late. We had another webinar on Zoom, um, so we were waiting for that to finish. And yeah, we had a couple of technical difficulties as well, but all is well. So um, without further ado, I'm going to get started and share my screen and get our slides up. Okay. Um, so. Welcome everybody to CVBC's very first food and drink virtual trade mission. Um, my name is Maxime, I'm the service delivery executive here at CVBC and today I'm joined by an all-star panelist um, cast of specialist um, China speakers today. We are covering uh, quite a lot of the world. We've got Ran up in Beijing in China. Hello Ran. Um, we also Hello, have everyone. He's based in Shanghai and we have Antonetta down south in England and I myself, I'm in Scotland. So. We're all across the country today. Um, today we are going to be talking about reconnecting with Chinese buyers and seizing opportunities post COVID. Um, very quickly, I just want to explain the Zoom webinar panel. Everyone is probably very uh, used to using Zoom by now <laughs> after all the lockdown, but just very quickly want to explain. Um, we have a reactions tab here. Um, you can all give me a thumbs up and that will let me know that you can hear and see everything we're doing. I think it's working okay. So that's good. We also have our questions box. So we're going to have three presentations today from our three speakers, and then we're going to have a quick Q&A at the end. Uh, please do send us questions. We have a chat box and a question box. So whichever is easiest, just fire those across um, any, any burning questions, and I will collect those and we'll address them at the end. So please don't be shy and do ask questions. So first and foremost, I'm going to introduce our wonderful speakers today. As I said, First, we have Ran. So Ran Guo is the Assistant Director of the Food and Drink Sector here at CBBC. Um, Ran works closely with partner UK government departments and trade associations to deliver research reports, trade missions and local showcasing events. She also organises and participates in sector trade shows around China when these are happening, which is why we're doing this at the moment. Um, prior to joining CBBC, Ran worked in the consulting industry in Shanghai and Beijing for six years. Uh, where she developed her specialties in primary market research, company due diligence, and competition intelligence analysis. So welcome, Ran. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Maxime. Hello, everyone. Um, and I'll introduce our second speaker as well. This is Antoinette Becker, Director of Consumer Economy and Head of the Food and Drink sector here in the UK. Antoinette joined CBC after more than 20 years of living and working in China. She's fluent in Mandarin and has worked for a range of international publications, including the Economist Intelligence Unit and the research arm of The Economist as well, reporting on China's macroeconomic trends and doing fieldwork in different regions and researching specific industries and companies. Antoinette has worked with hundreds of uh, companies over the last five years, and she has an excellent grasp of the challenges companies face when approaching the market for the first time and through long-term China experience and she has a unique, unique knowledge of the potential pitfalls and obstacles to be overcome. Welcome Antoinette, thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you. And last but certainly not least, we have a very special guest speaker today. He is based in Shanghai and this is James Graylin, Director of Heighton International. James has all, over 20 years working experience and live, also living in China. As I said, he's based in Shanghai and has worked with the food and drink sector most notably uh, developing the multi-award winning Wanling Tea House. Hayton was established in 2007 and through his work with Hayton, um, he has helped a number of clients from SMEs to museums, helping them to access the China market through customized logistics solutions based on their consumer needs. A little bit about CVVC and Hayton. I'm sure everyone knows about CVVC and what we do, but we are the leading organization supporting UK-China trade. We have offices across the UK and 13 offices across China is across all of the first, second and third tier cities. Um, we have a wonderful China team over there on the ground supporting UK businesses breaking into the market. Haiten is a Shanghai based uh, international logistics partner and they specialize in air and sea freight forwarding. And as I said, across a variety of industries from food and drink to very niche uh, products to do with museums, so antiques and things like that. So very, very interesting. And today we're going to be hearing about Hayton's brand new offer. It's very exciting. It's 
specific for um, food and drink UK brands looking for to manage a long term um, China market. And James is going to be telling us more about that later. So very excited to hear about that. And as I said, our agenda today. So first of all, we're going to hear from Ran. She's going to give us an overview of the post-COVID China consumer market, followed by Antonetta, who's going to go into more in-depth trend analysis, followed by our virtual trade mission and virtual meet the buyer offer. And finally, James will introduce Heighton's new supply chain launchpad offer. So enough for me. Um, without further ado, I think Ran is going to share her screen and we'll get started. Hey. Sure, let me bring on my screen. Um, right. Right. Um, so today's webinar is going to be basically on what has happened um, in China during the last couple of months and what is happening at the moment. Um, what's the latest trend and how do we go from there? And the some of the op opportunities and, and services that uh, we'll be able to offer um, to the UK brands, basically. Um, so we all know that um, you know, COVID um, during the past month um, has, um, has basically reshaped the retail and uh, food services industry, not just in China, but basically um, over the world. But then um, we'll be able to observe some of the phen phenomena um, in China because China has um, so far um, sort of completed the whole um, cycle from the outbreak to contain um, containment and, and to kind of recovery or on the way to recovery. Um, so basically, um, you know, during, during a couple months um, since Chinese Spring Festival, which, um, which was in February, China has experienced a two month lockdown. Um, and then um, people were gradually coming back to work, um, working from home and now offices um, in all cities um, in China are, are reopened. Um, so people are um, people are able to um, work from offices again and schools are reopening and kids are going back to school and et cetera, et cetera. So from the, from the food and drink perspective, um, we see um, actually some of the categories suffer most from, from the impact of COVID and some other categories are, are actually doing pretty well and observing some growth. For example, the grain, oil and daily necessities um, continue to to, to rise despite that, um, despite the, the shortage, um, the lockdown and the log logistic challenges. So, um, so if we look, take a closer look at the at these categories, um, we see, like I said, the, the daily necessities that people need, um, including grain, oil, um, they actually see a, a, a growth uh, increase. Because, um, because people are, are being locked um, in home and then they're, they're forced to cook at home and a lot of them cannot go outside to, to, to eat outside. So um, more people are, are turning um, to, to supermarkets, um, to raw materials and to, to cooking at home. Um, so we can see that from... Uh, from, uh, from January to March, um, that there is still a, a big drop of, uh, of retail sales. But then from April, obviously, report, a, April had been a turning point. Um, there was still a loss, but then compare, uh, comparatively, um, it became better um, than in uh, January to March. So, um, so in this session, we're also going to analyze some of the new trends um, that are actually not new trends, they were already there, but then they got kind of amplified um, due, due to COVID. So one of them is this um, group buying model, which may be new to a lot of the consumers and brands um, in the UK. Um, so how it works is that, um, so the platform or the retailers or the brands will communicate directly to the end users through a WeChat group. So we'll talk about WeChat in the next slides. Um, and then to form a, con a consumer base and to offer discounts, um, promotions directly in that group, in the co consumer groups. And the consumers uh, will be able to kind of collate, um, collect the orders together and play these orders um, directly to the platforms or to the brands. 
So for all of these to happen, the, the very important tool is WeChat. So I'm sure a lot of the, the audience today will be already on WeChat. But for those who are very new to China, new um, to, to WeChat, um, so here's an overview, kind of a glance of uh, what WeChat can do. WeChat is a, it's, it's a very scary because it's too powerful. So one can essentially stay and spend a whole day um, without leaving WeChat, basically. Um, so it's a comprehensive uh, app that kind of combines the, the, the functions of Twitter, uh, of Facebook, and, and, and uh, of uh, WhatsApp. So on the communication side, it allows people to, to make calls, to message each other, to form a group, and to conduct group calls. But on the social side, so it allows people to interact with each other uh, through WeChat moment, um, and then to search people nearby. And then it also carries a very important function, which, which is the WeChat Pay. So um, WeChat Pay, you, through WeChat Pay, you'll be able to kind of order and pay for your meals at the restaurant. You'll be able to transfer money to your friends and families. Um, you'll be able to order taxi and pay for taxis. And uh, on the commercial side also, it kind of integrates a different, many different kinds of uh, mini apps on WeChat. Um, so it's a qu quite a powerful tool and it can be commercialized in, in many different ways. So the group buying during uh, COVID lo lockdown was basically uh, about fresh produce, for example, um, the vegetables, the fruits and meat and seafood, because um, people were not um, allowed to leave their residential area. Um, so the, the, the only way to make it possible for, for them to get their daily grocery is, um, is, for, is through delivery. And uh, it was also, it kind of also enabled um, the retailers or, or the uh, platforms to cut down logistic costs. Um, so if you join, basically, in, basically in, my, um, in my residential area, for example, there's multiple kind of stickers um, in every door. And then with QR codes, if you scan them with your WeChat, you'll be able to join that group and then place an order with all the other consumers in that group. And then the nearby convenience store or the wet market will be able to deliver your order to your door. So what, one of the, the, um, the most um, kind of featured um, app um, that, that um, is a result of the group buying model in China is the is a Pinduoduo. So for, for, for uh, many of you, Pinduoduo might not be very familiar, um, but then it's a very fast growing company um, that is catching up very fast to, um, with, uh, with Alibaba. Um, so it was established only in 2015, but then by the year of 2018, it was already listed um, in NASDAQ. Um, so the, the idea uh, behind Pinduoduo was really group buying. So everything sold on Pinduoduo has a discounted price. And if you click on the product you would like to buy, it shows two prices. One of them is the normal price and the other one is the discounted price. And in order to purchase that product through a discounted price, you have to wait until there's a minimum number of consumers that will be able to, um, that are willing to purchase this product with you. So it's not instant. Um, sometimes you have to wait for five minutes, um, you know, half an hour um, to gather that, um, that many consumers. And you can also, share the link of the product you would, would like to buy to your family and friends on WeChat and ask them basically to join this group buying with you. Um, so the idea behind it is that every consumer turns into a brand ambassador for, for the brand. They are promoting the brand. They are promoting the products for the brand owner in order to get a discount. So it's kind of a win-win um, situation. Another very hot uh, phenomenon um, in today's Chinese um, consumer market is the, the, the live streaming. Um, so on the, on the uh, left side, the picture, um, it's a picture of two guys. So on the left is a very famous um, Chinese TV host. He works for the government um, TV, CCTV. And then next to him um, in blue shirt um, is a, the hottest um, live streaming KOL in China today called Li Jiaqi. So, um, this featured a session they did together to kind of promote uh, products from Hubei to kind of help boost local economy after, um, after COVID. 
So just some data to share with everyone. So according to the Ministry of, uh, of Commerce, just during the first quarter um, in 2020, so during the first three months, 4 million e-commerce live streaming sessions took place um, online and then generate, generating um, altogether uh, 11 billion pounds um, sales. And, uh, you know, a, a, a KOL like Li Jiaqi, a session of his can usually attract uh, around 30 million users. So it's quite, um, you know, quite uh, impressive. Um, some of the, the advantages of uh, live streaming is that first it reaches out uh, to a very wide uh, group of audience, which is not possible during traditional campaigns or promotion. Um, you normally cannot have 30 million uh, views or users um, at one offline gathering. And then um, it generates feedback very quickly because usually at the, you know, the, the software or app um, where you use for live streaming, um, consumers will be able to interact with the um, live streamer, with the KOLs instantly through messaging. So you'll be able to see how they think of the brand, how they think of the presentation, how they think of the packaging instantly, very quickly. And then um, live streaming allows brands to tell the history, the story behind um, directly through the KOL to, to the consumers. So you, especially for, um, for our products, for British or, or imported products, the key is to tell the heritage behind. Um, so live streaming becomes a very suitable way to promote your, your brand or your product. And this is just an example uh, of the two uh, live streaming session we just did um, actually last Sunday and this Monday. Um, so CBBC, we had our first UK Super Brand Day with a, a key KOL um, live streamer on WeChat and with another um, celebrity KOL on, on Taobao, on Tmall. Um, so this is the pictures of um, um, our MD with uh, Jijie, the uh, celebrity um, KOL on Tmall. So on our um, live streaming session uh, on uh, Monday, we were able to um, accumulate 1.6 million views uh, for the duration of four hours. And um, some of the food and drink um, brands participated uh, include um, Novel Tea and Slim Fast, uh, which had generated um, very satisfactory um, sales revenue. So this is something I think um, we can offer um, to brands either, either um, you're new to China or, or you're already in China is to kind of expand your, your brand awareness and to reach the end consumers um, through online promotions and activities. So uh, what has happened um, in the import food and drink market um, during the couple, uh, past couple months? So just some data uh, on the different categories, uh, the growth um, or decrease. Uh, from January to April. Um, so what has, um, what, ha what, has um, what has increased and what has dropped? Uh, we can see there some, some of the categories have really um, been affected by COVID. Um, these categories include um, uh, the spirits, unfortunately. Um, it was due, mostly due to the closure of uh, offline uh, food services, the bars, the, the clubs. Um, but it was also due to the lockdown or, or the slowdown of logistics and uh, the fact that a lot of people uh, in the UK or, or overseas um, are staying at home or working from home as well. But in some of the market, um, some of the categories had still observed strong growth, um, including meat and, and dairy, um, because this is, um, this is something that um, were already kind of in, in uh, huge demand before COVID. And um, also because of people's, um, you know, health consciousness um, developed during COVID and that a lot of people would prefer to intake more protein, um, healthy diets. And we can see that um, seafood here has um, also been affected uh, slightly. So according to some of our interviews with the seafood importers in China, um, this was due to, first of all, the, the logistics and uh, um, unstable supply and the increase of, uh, of uh, logistic costs. But then it was also due to um, people's 
kind of lack of a willingness to, to purchase um, more expensive imported seafood products because there are worries about um, you know, financial um, uncertainties. So they will switch to cheaper domestic um, substitutes. And also because of COVID, um, uh, because of the lockdown of, uh, of a lot of, lot of retail or food services channels, um, it resulted in um, the oversaturation of uh, Chinese um, uh, lakes, ponds, rivers. So the Chinese government had this um, need to kind of help clear stock, stocks for Chinese um, seafood farmers as well. So some of the interviews uh, we did with, uh, with the uh, food and drink uh, importers suggest that, that uh, April and May uh, was really a turning point for them. Um, things were really ugly in um, January and March, but then it's, uh, everything's um, gradually picking up now, especially after, um, after April. That some of the bar owners and uh, imported drinks um, uh, importers said that 50% uh, of the bars are open now, and then they're starting to see more orders from, from the bars. And some of, um, some of the interesting um, comparison, the observations uh, of uh, retailers and food services, this kind of echoes um, our observation in the beginning that retailers are actually not that much affected by, by COVID um, because that a lot of people need to stay at home and they turn to you know, home cooking. Um, their demand uh, of uh, products from retailers are, um, is actually increasing. But then food services really suffers um, badly from, from the lockdown. Um, so from January to March, um, their, their year to year on year uh, growth has dropped by 44 um, percent, and um, you know it recovered slightly uh, in April, but then still the drop is quite um, it's quite big. So some just some more um, insights from uh, from from our fellow um, importers and partners. Um, so some of the bar owners are are saying that um, they are they have reached uh, seventy percent of their revenue uh, compared to the same period um, in last year. Um, and, um, you know, they're um, especially on, on gin, uh, which is a, um, a new category for them. Um, they're importing or bringing in more uh, gin brands um, to China, uh, but not, not necessarily from the UK, from, from the US or, or from Europe. I think this is a result of uh, the continuous education of uh, a lot of the like, in-market gin uh, companies, um, as well as, um, as uh, you know, um, the Department for International Trade and, and trade bodies like, um, like ourselves. And, uh, you know, one importer has said um, that whiskey uh, price um, has kind of rised, uh, uh, obviously, um, due to the, the lack of uh, um, um, supply or manpower um, in overseas. But retailers, on the other hand, are, are quite uh, optimistic. Um, we have uh, interviewed uh, Jenny Liu in Beijing, City Super in Shanghai, who said that they have um, not seen very huge impact on their offline business. Um, uh, basic food stuff like flour or pasta or meat are still in very strong demand. So some of, some of the new uh, demand generated from, from COVID, um, as uh, we can all think of, obviously, um, people are turning to more healthy products. So we have um, interviewed some confectionery or, or uh, sweets uh, importers in, in China who had said um, their business had been affected a lot because people's taste changed um, because of COVID. Um, they're becoming more health conscious now. Um, not so much into um, high calories, um, high, high uh, fat products, but more into uh, products with uh, health benefits or, or low uh, calorie diet. And uh, a lot of the importers are looking for uh, more creative um, products or products with uh, more unique selling points. This is also because um, that online distribution channels um, has raised so much 
and becomes one of the major um, distribution channels that importers or distributors cannot overlook. And in terms to catch those eyes um, um, from, from online and, and um, to attract young consumers, um, that products um, really have to come up with very strong, um, better packaging, um, better stories, more unique um, stories to tell. So on the, on the seafood um, side as well, I think uh, um, a lot of the importers are still um, being affected by logistics. So one of the strong um, demand or requests that we always hear um, noise from our importers is that they want to make sure um, their suppliers can maintain very stable supply. Um, so I think this is something that, um, that, that we need to wait um, for, for the overseas uh, suppliers um, to, to recover um, for the UK to get back on track. Um, so demand in China is there, it's picking up and importers are so um, interested in, in carrying on uh, new brands, but it depends on the situation um, in the UK now. Um, but I think um, overall the market um, is gradually back on track and it's, it is the right time um, to interact with the, with the market, with the importers in China, although uh, I know uh, the brand owners cannot, still cannot um, physically travel to China, but it is time to keep the conversations warm um, and to keep the momentum. Um, so that's all I have to share um, in terms of what has happened uh, in China. I think Antoinette next is going to talk about the trends um, and the uh, opportunities that we can catch in the future. Thank you so much, Ran. And yeah, wonderful. Stop sharing my screen. Yeah. Thank you so much. Really great to see just an overview of what's happening post COVID in China. Um, and we will now hear from Antonetta. I think Antonetta is going to share her screen. Possibly. Uh, yeah, Maxime, I'm just trying. Uh, just give me a second. Um, <laughs> um, just to let everybody know, um, because of some dodgy internet connections here and there, we might turn off the webcam whilst presenting so that everybody can hear us properly because that's the most important thing. And yeah, just a reminder as well, um, please do feel free to send across questions throughout. Like I said, you can message us in the general chat group um, to either all panelists and audience or through the Q&A uh, tab as well. Uh, Maxime, I have trouble sharing my screen. So if you could just put the slides, please. Uh, from the um, um, consumer analysis, then we'll go from there. Perfect, okay. Thank you. Let's just skip through. Thanks very much. And I'll have to probably trouble you just to skip through that. No problem. Here we go. Wonderful, thank you very much. Um, yeah, uh, good morning everyone and um, apologies, I think we've had um, an unstable connection earlier, so I've uh, determined that if I stop my video, probably that works a little bit better. I'll rejoin you with visual once um, um, the Q&A session starts. But um, wonderful to um, be afforded an opportunity to present uh, to so many companies uh, today. And um, just to summarize uh, the earlier presentation uh, from Ran, um, I think what COVID-19 has done to, um, to China's already a very socially shared economy is has to push it even further to digital. I think as consumers dug in at home um, and um, were told to be socially distant, they found new and innovative ways to be connected. So even before the crisis, everything Chinese consumers did was shared. Purchasing decisions, comments, um, ideas, um, new product um, um, appraisals. Um, this has um, now been uh, accelerated uh, to uh, a much greater extent. And we are now looking at a completely different consumer crowd, which was created during the um, lockdown. And so it is the Jiren um, or um, the stay at home um, consumers um, who uh, would spend probably most of their time um, on their mobiles or on other um, internet connected devices 
browsing for news about the crisis, worrying about their relatives, um, searching um, about the latest um, health innovations, keeping fit online, um, trying new cocktail recipes online, um, uh, enjoying live streaming shows, as Ran uh, explained earlier, um, and looking to be um, even more creative and digitized. Uh, Maxime, next slide, please. So um, I think uh, the consumer crowd, that, crowd that's emerging um, for imported food and drink products at the moment um, is looking um, like a crowd of um, comfort creatures who um, would go out um, and enjoy new experiences and try novel products, but equally as happy to remain at home and bring some of those um, new experiences um, on their home front. So brands who are launching um, into China and who are considering tapping into these new social commerce platforms need to be aware that it is this kind of fiercely competitive scene and everybody is grabbing for attention from this uh, very, very fickle and very spoiled crowd with so much to choose from as they're sitting at home. So what brands have tried to experiment with is various ways of crossover collaboration between different products, crossover collaboration with other consumer sectors. And I think we've taken a closer look at some of those products that are emerging in the market. We've also focused a little bit more on the plant-based you know, plant innovation um, products that they're launching and really zoomed in um, on the opportunity um, with milk. Uh, which um, I believe from UK side is underdeveloped, um, but it is a growing point for post-COVID food and drink market in China. Next slide, please. So um, I think in order to be noticed in that very, very competitive market, um, brands are attempting to collaborate with each other um, and leverage um, um, other brands, um, USPs um, or um, brand stories um, in order to um, trap that um, novelty um, thirst of Chinese consumers. Next please, Maxine. Um, here are some examples um, of what's happening um, uh, with new product um, innovation in, in the Chinese market. So for those of you who have visited China, and had wondered either in the um, small croutons of Beijing um, or in the um, windy lanes of Shanghai, they would have definitely come across um, a white rabbit um, candy, which is uh, a kind of um, time-honored uh, Shanghai confectionery brand, which has now partnered with one of um, China's big dairy giants, Bry Dairy, to launch their own flavored ice cream. So this is an interesting experimentation where um, you know, the new um, uh, pursuit of um, uh, products for leisure and pleasure is stepping into a heritage um, brand USP. There's some interesting experimentation there with local, localized uh, crisp flavors, as well as the launch of a, the first uh, Baijiu boozy biscuits. Uh, I think we have a number of brands in, um, I think I've certainly come across one in Scotland who does um, alcoholic drink biscuits to go with various um, spirits. So a Baijiu, which is China's traditional uh, fiery white liquor biscuit, is certainly a novelty in the market. Um, there is also um, an interesting exploration of new um, bubble tea flavored desserts, uh, which taps into the popularity of um, Haiti bubble tea. Um, so lots um, of movement and um, fluid exchanges in those categories. Next, Maxine, please. And it, this is not the full story. Um, brands are reaching out to um, established cultural institutions or, or to um, um, creative companies um, or to um, um, some um, local internet sensations, key opinion leaders, in order to get ahead of the competition and launch some um, uh, some new um, some new products. So uh, an interesting um, exploration is the uh, perfume water flavored coffee, and the coffee flavored perfume water launched by KFC. Next one, please, Maxine. Um, so um, plant based. Um, um, 
new products uh, is, the, is the new craze. Obviously, I think uh, there was a huge emotional trauma after the um, coronavirus crisis uh, with um, you know, the various um, conspiracy theories of where the virus originated, how it originated, so which uh, led to a huge spike in interest into um, animal products alternatives. It was there before China has centuries old uh, Buddhist um, vegetarian um, tradition. Um, so uh, this is kind of firmly ingrained in the Chinese culinary um, tradition. Um, as it is just been taken to a new level and embraced by almost um, every significant player in the food and drink market. Next, Maxine. So you would see that uh, the likes of Papa Jones and KFC and Starbucks among the um, multinationals have all launched various products um, that are um, plant-based um, and so are uh, Chinese um, um, market players like uh, Lamy and Shuo, um, who have launched their plant-based spicy uh, noodles. This used to be a, um, a favorite of mine when I was living back in China. So I wonder whether the taste is the same as it, was, as it is the original. Ely, um, China's dairy giant, um, is launched their uh, new plant-based uh, milk products as well. Next, Maxine. Um, I think I um, um, kind of further dive into the desire for um, uh, for fresh pasteurized milk. Um, uh, I think um, traditionally China is regarded as a market um, which suffers from um, a high dose of lactose intolerance. Um, however, with the introduction of um, various um, adapted to the local market products like uh, fruit flavored cheese products for children, a fruit flavored ambient yogurt, this has changed. Next slide, please, Maxine. So, um, China has embraced um, dairy consumption, uh, although this is still um, on a level that is not comparable to any other um, uh, market uh, in Asia and, and in the West. Um, there are new products being launched across, uh, across the sector, and these cover um, the range of um, fresh milk, ambient yogurt, um, different um, adapted local flavor cheese products, etc. Uh, I think an interesting one here is Bright Dairy um, um, Jersey, um, Jersey milk um, launch, um, which obviously um, taps into the um, uh, Jersey cows and Jersey milk's popularity uh, with Chinese consumers. Um, all of the um, uh, big players like Coca-Cola are looking to partner with uh, some of China's um, dairy um, companies to launch crossover products uh, and actually grab some of that um, uh, market share. It's, it's a very hot trend following, uh, following the crisis. And as Ram rightly pointed out, uh, you know, uh, consumers try to stay at home as much as possible and cook their own meals. However, their desire for fresh produce, for for some anything that could uh, prove fresh credentials were unsatiable, and I don't think it is likely to go away very easily after the crisis passed. Next, Maxine. Yeah, I think just some um, um, uh, some insight into the um, um, the size of the market. I still there is still um, uh, quite a big. Um, um, room for growth. Um, I think liquid milk uh, sold on um, Alibaba's channels uh, grew 98% um, in April this year. Um, and I think the most popular products were, um, you know, the ambient milk, ambient yogurt, um, and um, um, various other experimentation in the frozen category with ice cream. Um, funnily enough, in China, from regulatory point of view, ice cream is not considered dairy. Um, but there have been certainly some very interesting uh, launches um, um, in the market. Next, please. A little bit more um, into the um, into this uh, growing trend. Um, we don't have um, um, much present in that uh, particular market segment. Hence, I think um, uh, Ron and the team took a special pain to. Um, um, dig out a little bit more um, into what's happening in the market into into this segment. We are really keen to work with companies to grow that uh, as much as possible. 
Next one, please. And I think I'm conscious of time. We still have um, um, another fascinating speaker. So I um, just wanted to draw your attention that um, as we're bringing you some updates from the market, um, we would like you to take um, the opportunity of the market's early um, comeback compared to some, some of the other international markets and reconnect with your former context um, and, some, and, and look to uh, identify some new ones. Uh, we are looking to um, recruit for a virtual meet the Food and Green China buyer to take place in mid-July, on the 15th of July. Uh, we will work with a group of 15 UK brands who will have the opportunity to um, meet five Chinese buyers on the day. Um, the identification of the Chinese buyers will be based on the pool of the recruited UK companies. So um, I think we're looking to bring some of the popular categories in the market at the moment, uh, snacks, dairy, spirits, um, any non-alcoholic and interesting drinks. Um, we have all of the details of the virtual meet the buyer on our website, um, but the easiest one um, is to, um, if you wanted to have more details or further discussion, is to email either Maxime, myself or Ran, and we'll have a follow-up discussion with yourself. Next one, Maxime. And um, um, the other thing I wanted to share with you, we have some exciting new um, service offers um, that are launching um, in the China market. Um, as you know, we are a, a membership organization with um, over 60 years presence in the market. So our membership business network in China and the UK includes companies of, um, large and small across various sectors. So by launching the Heritage British Brands Workshop in China, we are seeking to bridge um, the high net worth individual consumer that work for some of our financial and corporate clients in China, the likes of the banks like HSBC or Standard Charter and, and to the big uh, accounting houses, etc. with um, our um, consumer brand companies who are looking to grow their brands in the market. The point of the Heritage Brands Workshop is to um, introduce curious um, um, Chinese consumers to um, the history of a brand, to the culture of its consumption, and of course to um, let them taste it and experience it um, um, in an unhurried environment. We have done already our first trials where we took a British tea brand um, to HSBC where we organized an um, um, afternoon tea exploration of the different tea blends uh, with HSBC employee during, during a lunch break. So um, this is a um, brand new product we are, we are launching and particularly relevant for the brands already in the market looking to, um, uh, to grow their B2C um, um, digital footprint. And I think um, I will um, stop here now um, and I will um, let Maxime um, introduce our next speaker and I'll be back uh, with you for any follow-up questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Antoinette. Um, yeah, a really nice look there at um, some more in-depth trends, consumer trends going on. We are a bit pressed for time, so without further ado, I will let James speak. Um, James, can you share your screen? Um, no, if you, if you wouldn't mind, if you can uh, deal with the slides, that would be much appreciated. Thanks very much. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just give it it's with me. <laughs> hey, we're dealing with many technical difficulties today, unfortunately. Um, Just well, to say it's already amazing. We have four people in different locations. That's already pretty spectacular, Maxine. Yes, so it's lovely. It's like a world representation. <laughs> um, great. So I've got James's slides here. Lovely. Well, well, Maxine, sorting the slides out, just a, a big thank you for everyone joining today. Um, thank you very much for taking the time and uh, thank you also to the uh, presenters so far. Uh, I'm very pleased to be able to introduce our supply chain launch pad that we've been developing over the last couple of years, uh, partly in partnership with uh, CBBC uh, and also with some CBBC members um, as we work through different scenarios. So moving on to the next slide, I say one of the things that we've seen uh, is food and drink is obviously a, a quite a unique sector with different requirements. Um, there's also a way of looking at how we can 
fit in with the sort of the food and drink cycle within Shanghai. So obviously you've got FHC, um, and also with Siao as well. So if we look at the next slide and the next one. So there's quite a big challenge. I, say, I know some of you here have already been to China on various occasions. There's others that are looking at coming to China. Um, obviously there's a huge appeal of the 1.4 billion people and just targeting just a small part of that potentially brings a huge uh, opportunity for businesses. However, within that, you have to consider all of the time, all of the preparation, the, the actual financial side, and also the opportunity costs for many companies of considering whether to come to China or develop existing markets. So next slide. Most people certainly won't, when I've spoken to people that have been to China or during FHC and SAO, everyone is very impressed with the country. It's been a fascinating visit. There's a lot of, for a lot of people, it's very different to what they expected, but they've had a chance to actually connect with the market, understand, see some shops, see some of the other, the other products that have been popular here, been able to connect with people and having very good positive conversations. Um, and obviously, if you've ever been to a trade show in China, you know samples don't stay on the uh, trade stand very long. So you get a very positive feel from the, the visit. Next slide. So after a visit to China, you, you've put all that work in. You've, you understand the market. Hopefully, you know your product so you, know, you can see where the opportunities are. You've got loads of new business cards. You've had a few face-to-face -face meetings. So you go back to the UK, and then what are you gonna do? You start following up, sending emails, but the challenge of trying to do that remotely is, is pretty great. Next slide. The challenge is, what do you do then? Obviously you connect, reconnect with some of the interested distributors, some of the different channels. Quite often the first thing is they'll ask for is, can I have a sample? The challenge is if anyone's tried sending samples to China, it's very unpredictable, it's very expensive, and not exactly quick. If there's no feedback from people, what are you gonna do? How are you gonna follow up? How are you gonna push people? One of the things we often see, especially with people that have been to China for the first time attending a trade show, they're, they're hoping for this magical distributor, the one that's gonna come along order full container loads and do all of the management on the ground but these are very far and few between and also many people have discovered that those sorts of distributors sometimes don't actually follow up on develop the market in the way that they'd like to so what's your next steps you're going to come back out do some more research do some online marketing but how are you going to do it when you're not here next slide so what's, what's, what is actually the mission? Why do you want to come to China? What's your objectives? Next slide. So I think for most people, the, the, the aim of the game is to sell, sell something. So what are you selling? You're selling your product. So we hope to come to China, make huge sales, be able to create a whole new market that we didn't have, and maybe retire a little bit early, maybe. But what are you going to sell? Next slide. Have you got any products here? That's the big challenge. So at the end of the day, you're here to sell products. At the end of the day, you can, lots of people when they come to the trade show, they send maybe a few cases with the, with the trip with the trade show or the exhibition companies, but that's only gonna get you through the trade show. What is it you're actually gonna sell? The challenge is, is how are you gonna get product here? Typically, the lead, lead time for getting sea freight is around two to three months. Question is, are those people that you've just met, had a great discussion with on the show stand, are they gonna wait three months for a product? A lot of them probably won't even wait a month. So the question is, what are you trying to sell? Also, just consider what is the reality of, of achieving that magical, almost like a unicorn of a, a, a distributor that's gonna buy that FC full container load of products. 
it's very unlikely, but if you're going to invest all that time and money, why not make it easy for yourself? At the end of the day, if you've got product in China, then there's a lot more that you can do remotely. But if you're just going to go back to the UK and think about your next steps, you almost have to then wait for the next cycle. Next slide. I think everyone here who's, who's been working in food and drink for a long time is whatever market you're in, whether you're in the UK, whether you're in Europe, the US, you have to be committed. It's not a matter of coming and doing one visit and then basically creating the market. It's about repetition, coming back, being prepared, imagining what you want to do in the next steps. And at the end of the day, if you, where there's a will, there's a way. Next, uh, next slide. So what are we proposing? At the end of the day, you've done all of this groundwork, you've done all this research, you've prepared your trip for FHC or CIR, but you still don't have any product here. So why don't we make it easy for you? We, you've been prepared, you've prepared all your materials, you've prepared all of your, all of your trip, but why not put some product in the ground? You need to make sales easy, remove barriers for people to make a decision, remove barriers for people to actually try your product. For example, in our solution, the idea is that when you hit the ground in China, you've got one or two pallets here. When you meet someone in the show, and they say, oh, I'm really interested in your product. Do you have any? You go, yes, I've got some. When do you want it? And they go, well, when can I have it? You can say, well, I can have it to you in three days time. You can make an impact straight away and actually hit straight away and contact with the customer. Potentially, you can actually have product into, your, into a distributor while you're still in China. If you get good feedback from them buying a few cases, you can maybe extend your trip or even just go and have another face-to-face -face meeting. The other thing is I firmly believe is very important. If a customer wants a sample, it's very easy. To, everyone can ask for a free sample. If someone is willing to commit to five cases or a mix of one case of each product or SKU, there's a, there's a commitment there. They're actually wanting to commit and buy from you. So again, it's a great test to filter out maybe some of these business cards that people have come along and they're going to say, I want 20 containers, uh, I'll place an order for a million. And then when you go back to the UK, you never get a reply from them. The other thing is also to be extreme flexible if you've got product here you're not tied with one distributor you can start make, testing out different regions you can maybe test out different channels you can test out different markets so again it's it's about giving you the tools to make it easier for you to work in china next slide so this is just a bit of an example timeline that we've put out there and really like i say we, we foresee really working in China is, is, is a multi-year idea. So for example, if you engage with the CBBCs in advance, talk to them, what's, what do they need? What do you need? Before the event, you need to be ready three months before the, any event or any trip to actually get product out here. Maybe you can include your, business, your printing materials in with that as well. So you've already prepared, so you can follow through and be ready and actually make the most of your trip. Next slide. So that's a little bit of what we're trying to aim at. Get you in a position where you've got product that you can sell, that you can test the market, you can give samples, you can maybe even make a bit of revenue just on based on your trip. So we had a very nice introduction from Maxine, just a little bit about myself, but who is Hyten? So as, as we heard earlier, we're based in Shanghai. We have a regional office in Dorset in the UK. Uh, and we're a, a mix of Chinese and obviously myself, who's based out here. Most of our solutions are very much customized based on our individual customers' needs. But we aim to like provide a one-stop shop of different requirements from a very simple logistics solution to an importation to a fulfillment cold chain solutions are all available depending on what our customers need. Next slide. So our offer is that 
we will work with you from from the outstart make sure your documentation is correct make sure you've got all of your certificates make sure everything else that you need to get into china is already there we'll organize the pickup of the product we'll move it all the way through to the uk take all of the stress away from chinese customs and get away from all of the uh, CIQ quarantine. We can provide pick and pack. We can provide national delivery, whether that's B to C, B to B. We can issue a FAPL. So those that have been out here, obviously if you're trying to move into a new distributor, everyone needs a FAPL, so a formal invoice. So we can provide that. So again, it's another barrier taken away from you engaging when you're out here on your trip. We can, based on your sales, we can then actually remit to foreign currency back to you. We can do stock control and reporting as well. So we're here to be very, very flexible and involved with you. Next slide. So in terms of the development, and we really see it as three very distinctive phases. So if it's your first time to China or your first trade show, we just see it as a very much as an entry. So giving you some form of presence, allowing you to actually be able to engage with the market. The next phase, maybe you've already been in the market. Maybe you've tested the market, you've been in visits. Maybe you've got one or two smaller distributors, but never really got any momentum. Here we're looking at giving you a greater base that you can then go out into the market, maybe leverage some contacts that you've got that didn't go forwards maybe because they couldn't deal with minimal order quantities or didn't want to wait and then in the expansion phase then we go to a more traditional sort of logistics solution where we maybe step back a little bit more but we can help manage your supply chain uh, help work with you to improve your efficiency within china so again a very flexible overall solution next slide So we've mentioned it before, but uh, timing, timing is uh, critical. So very much utilize your year, make the most of it, get ready. As you can see in the corner here, it's like a cycle. If you wanna be engaged in FHC, that's very much getting ready for spring or summer sales. Sial is getting very much ready for Christmas and New Year sales. So be aware to be, make the most of the time. Um, and at the end of the day, you want when you make a meeting make sure you are able to strike while the iron is hot next slide so i'll let you have a look at this please come back to us either through cbbc's or to myself or ask questions in the forum but this is a bit of an idea we've tried to keep it as simple as possible based on pallet volumes uh, and then based on storage so again, take, take, take a look at the presentation later on and then come back with any queries. Next slide. So again, we want to try and make this as clear and as simple for you. No surprises in, in terms of what your costing is. It's all very clear and upfront. It, gives, it makes it much more cost effective than trying to ship samples, but hopefully it puts you in a position where you can actually engage, make sales, and actually get some return on your investment from your first trip, as well as having that stock on the ground that you can then follow up with distributors when you're back in the UK. You can use some of the services from CBBC to engage with new channels or new customers, and you can still reply to them that you've got product in China and you can deliver it to them within a few days. Next slide. For those that are looking at expanding, maybe those that we've worked with, um, those that are already engaged in the in the market already, then the development phase solution may be a great solution there. Uh, just a bit more flexibility in terms of payment. Next slide. So Chris uh, is my colleague who's international sales manager. He heads up our specialist uh, segment on wine and beer. Uh, they have, we actually have a partnership there where we actually have an online platform that can push through volumes as well. So Chris is our specialist in that market. These are my details. If anyone wants to connect, please do. My WeChat number is just my Chinese mobile. Um, and obviously take a chance to go and visit our website. 
So uh, any questions, please let us know. Uh, thank you very much for all your time. Thank you very, very much, James. And um, I've had to just stop the share for a moment uh, so that we can read some of the questions that we have in our Q&A box. But I will put up um, James, Rand's and Antoinette's uh, contact details just in a moment. Um, so I can see um, there's, a, there's a bit going on in the chat, but I can also see we have one question, which we can answer now. Um, I'll just direct it to everybody, all of our speakers, and we'll see who's most suited to answer. Um, so the question is, are buyers in China looking to engage with international suppliers on digital platforms? They've recently launched a website called saladplate.com, and this seems to be helping in this direction. Okay, I think um, I can take this uh, forward we, and Ram can um, have a further input. So saladplay.com um, is supported by Informa, uh, which are the uh, organizers uh, of some of the main um, um, industry shows um, in China, particularly FHC Shanghai. Um, so obviously this is um, a new digital solution, given the fact that uh, none of the shows have happened this year so far. Uh, everything is, has been pushed to, to the second half of the year. Um, obviously, you know, you will probably get exposure to bias in the same way as you would do at the show. So the question remains, what do you do after the show? So um, I have not uh, tried uh, Salad Plate yet, um, but obviously here the, um, the key is with uh, what we're trying to kind of emphasize to companies is be prepared have a long-term plan, have a business development plan um, as to how you're going to tap into the different purchasing channels before you actually get on any um, virtual meet the buyer or on any digital platform to meet your potential Chinese partners and be prepared as to how you follow up with them. I think, Ram, anything your side in terms of how keen Chinese buyers are to use those platforms? Um, so yeah, so the long and short answer for this is yes and no. Um, some some buyers do, but then it's um, the the th the thing is that um, it's unknown to a lot of uh, buyers in China, um, and then there's so many of it, um, and then not all the importers um, speak so good English, and then there's this great firewall um, that's there. So it's, it makes it difficult for them to just uh, you know um, proactively. Um, see can use these uh, these trade uh, or platforms or, or apps. Um, um, so the, the the more traditional and the more uh, widely used uh, routes are still the trade shows, um, the trade bodies like ourselves and DIT. Uh, you know, face to face uh, meetings or events. Well, can I can I just uh, jump in as well? I think again, the on online platforms are a very good way of introducing. People, but at the end of the day, you still need product on the ground. And I think it's still very unlikely that someone who you meet online is going to take a financial commitment to buy a pallet or five pallets and then wait two to three months to try out your product. Whereas I think if you've got physical product here, someone who sees you online and you say, I've got a product, I can sell you 10 cases tomorrow, someone's willing to take that risk for maybe a a thousand pound investment or 500 pounds investment to try it and then they can take it out to the market you can get some feedback and if they're interested they can come back and buy more but to ex actually expect anyone to come and 